have been studying the life of David for a long time. Believe it or not, we started this sermon series on April 7th. And on that day, um, the very first sermon, it was about 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 1, and it covered a, a few chapters there. Turn to page 213 in your pew Bibles, and you'll see where that is from. And Ron, that should be the next uh, slide on, there we go. I have a few slides this morning because I want you to, uh, there, there's something in the text I, I want you to see. In that particular section, what do you notice, particularly if you go to chapter 2? Now, to summarize, this, the sermon, the text that day was about the birth of Samuel. He was the great prophet who would go on to anoint David to be king. But remember the situation of Samuel's birth. His mother, Hannah, was unable to become pregnant. And she cried out to God, and God gave her Samuel. Then in chapter 2, his mother Hannah prays a prayer. It's a, it's a poem, a song of thanks and praise to God. And I'm guessing that most of your Bibles will actually format that section as a poem. To, they want you to see that it actually is a song there in chapter 2. It's called Hannah's Song. Well, the book of Samuel which we typically call 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel. In our Bibles, it's two books, but it was one giant book. What we see then is it begins with a song. Now, fast forward with me to 2 Samuel chapter 22, which we're looking at today, page 259 in your pew Bible, all the way to the other end of the book of Samuel. We're nearing the end of David's life, and what do we find? If you look at how your Bible formats 2 Samuel 22, you'll see it's another song. So the, the story begins with the song and it ends with the song. Now, you might be curious, are there any other songs in the book of Samuel? Yes, there is, right in the middle. In 2 Samuel chapter 1, right after King Saul died and his son Jonathan died in battle, there we have what is probably the major turning point of the story. That, that's what sets up David to become king. Well, in that moment, David expresses a song. It's a lament. He says, oh, how the mighty have fallen. It's in, it's in 2 Samuel uh, chapter 1. So we have a song at the beginning, we have a song at the end, and we have a song right in the middle of this book of Samuel that we call 1st and 2nd Samuel. So today we're talking about the one that's at the very end. What will David sing as he looks back over his life? Well, in 2nd Samuel chapter 22, you might see that it in your Bible has a little subtitle. In the Pew Bibles, which is the New International Version, it's called David's Song of Praise. Now, that was just added by an editorial team. That's not original to the, the text. But it does a good job of giving us a sense of what it's all about. Maybe you have a different translation of the Bible that says something a little bit different. What they're telling us is that 2 Samuel chapter 22 is a song. Interestingly, you might also have a notation there that says that this is repeated in Psalm 18. So it's kind of a two for one today. We're not only going to be studying 2 Samuel chapter 22, we're going to be studying Psalm 18. If you do a verse by verse comparison of 2 Samuel chapter 22 and Psalm 18, you'll notice there are some slight differences between the two. Just a few words here and there that could be different translators, different Hebrew manuscripts. But what is mostly outstanding is that when you put those two passages side by side, how much they are word for word the same. Now, we're going to spend our time in 2 Samuel 22. And as I studied that passage this week, I, I went back to my favorite seminary professor, Dave Dorsey, who was an Old Testament genius, 
And I wanted to see, did he have anything to say about this? And he did, about Psalm 18 in his one book. And I'm going to use what he describes is the structure of this particular song. Dorsey was so attuned to parallelism and matching. And over the years, I, you've heard me mention this in sermons before. It's a writing style called chiasm. It's a chiastic structure. It's from the Greek letter chi, which is our letter X. And when you take a look at that X, you see it's a mirror image, top to bottom, side to side. And chiastic writing is mirror writing. Here's how it works. How many of you, when you went to school, you were taught essay outlines? I guess is that just about everybody. It's so common, like you see on the screen. You have main points and you have sub points, and eventually you get to a conclusion. This is a linear outline, start to finish. Well, chiastic structure is not linear. It is a mirror outline. It starts with a point A that's matched at the end with a point A prime. Then point B matches with B prime, C matches with point C prime, and notice how we're getting closer to the center, and the center has no match. This is ancient chiastic writing, and that unmatched center typically is the author's main point. In 2 Samuel 22 and in Psalm 18, Dorsey points out how David uses this structure to write his psalm. Now, our English Bibles, they don't print it that way. Maybe for a really short passage they could, but not a long one. This is a pretty long one. There just simply isn't enough room. You'd need a huge piece of paper to actually see this structure. So what Dorsey does is summarizes the main points so that you can actually see the structure. And that's what I'm going to do. You'll see it up on screen. And what it will do is it will drive us to that central point, the main point of the song. Now, first of all, look at verse 1. Verse 1 is kind of an intro. It's not actually part of the song. It simply says this. David sang to the Lord the words of this song when the Lord delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. In other words, David is happy. David is like so many of us who just shared this morning at the open mic, thanking God for what he's done. David is like so many of us around our Thanksgiving tables this coming Thursday when we'll take an opportunity to share what we're thankful for from this past year. In David's case, God has delivered him, and he breaks into worship. It's so appropriate. And that sets the tune for the beginning of the psalm. The first point is verses 2 through 4. Now, if Dave Dorsey is right, we should clearly see matches from these beginning points to these ending points. The beginning of the song should say the same thing as the end. So first of all, let's take a look at the beginning, verses 2 through 4. David says, The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield, and the horn of my salvation. He is my stronghold, my refuge, and my savior. From violent people you save me. I called to the Lord who is worthy of praise and have been saved from my enemies. So, what words and phrases does David repeat here? Words like, God is his rock, his salvation, his deliverer, who has rescued him from his enemies. And so this is what we see at the very beginning, verses 2 through 4. Rock, salvation, deliverer who rescues. Now, scan down to the conclusion, verses 47 through 51, and let's see if we can find those words. If David was writing using this parallel structure, we should be able to see it. Here's what verses 47 through 51 say. The Lord lives. Praise be to my rock. Exalted be my God, the rock, my Savior. He is the God who avenges me, who puts the nations under me, who sets me free from my enemies. You exalted me above my foes. From a violent man, you rescued me. 
Therefore, I will praise you, Lord, among the nations. I will sing the praises of your name. He gives his king great victories. He shows unfailing kindness to the anointed, to David and his descendants forever. So in that last section, does David describe God as a rock? Yes, he does. Three times, in fact, right? Does David describe God as his savior? Yes, he does. Does David mention God as his deliverer? Uh, no. Not if you're reading from the NIV. You might think, uh-oh, Dr. Dorsey, are you wrong? No, Dr. Dorsey is not wrong. Do you see the phrase in verse 49 that says, he sets me free from my enemies? In Psalm 18, which is what Dr. Dorsey was writing about, that same phrase uses the Hebrew word for deliver or save. It's the same Hebrew word that was in verses 2 through 4. So there is actually a match. David's purpose in both that opening and the concluding sections of the psalm is to praise God. Just like we did, he's got his open mic and he is thanking God for his deliverance. He wants to exalt God and declare God's power and strength and faithfulness. That action of praising God with words and songs is a major reason why we have this weekly gathering on Sundays. We want to direct our hearts and minds to who God is. It's why we make regular gathering on Sunday such a priority. God's our rock. He's our deliverer. He's our savior. Amid the craziness of our weeks and the frustration of what might be happening in our lives or our country or our world, we can allow our minds to get lost and overwhelmed in it all sometimes. But when we praise God like David does, we're recentered, refocused on what is true. God is true. He is our rock. He is our deliverer. That's what that's all about. So, after praising God, let's see where David goes next. See if we can look for his next pair of matching points. First, we go back almost to the beginning in verse 5. And what Dorsey suggests is that the next matching sections are a bit longer. Verses 5 through 20. And because they're so long, I'm not going to read them all. But I just want to point out a few phrases. And maybe in your Bibles, you can scan down through verses 5 through 20 and see these as well. So in verses 5 through 20, David is remembering a time when he was near death. And that would have been any of multiple times in his life. I mean, think about Goliath. Think about Saul chasing him. Think about when David was in battle. David was at death's door regularly. So what does he do? In verse 7, he remembers how he cried out to God, and God heard him. Then in verses 8 through 17, David writes this amazing description of God. How many of you like superhero movies? Maybe you got some superhero movie fans here. Look at this description of God in verses 8 through 17. When God is angry, the earth shakes. Smoke flares from God's nostrils and fire and hot coals from his mouth. He parts the heaven and rides down to earth on angels surrounded by storm clouds. When God shows up, he shoots lightning arrows at David's enemies. And he blows a powerful blast of wind that lays everything bare. God is the most super of all superheroes in this psalm. And then in verse 18, we read about God rescuing David in verse 19, he is David's support. In verse 20, he brings David to this spacious place. It's a place of safety. So what we're reading is just some incredible imagery in this portion of the song. We see how God is mighty. God is the, the Savior. Now, let's scan down to the matching verses and see if we can find any evidence for a match. If it's a match, we should see those same exact themes. God the superhero, crying out to God, God rescuing David from his enemies, God as David's support, God bringing David to a spacious place. 
The matching verses begin at verse 33. So again, it's a long section, verses 33 to 46. I'm not going to read it all. I'm just going to give you the, a summary. Now, first of all, in the previous section, God came with massive superhero power. In this matching section, however, David says now God empowers him with superhero power. He arms David with strength in verse 33. In verse 34, oh, this dumb iPad, I just lost it again. What did I do? There we go. Um, in verse 34, he makes David a fast and good climber. In verse 35, he trains David with a bow. I mean, think about all those descriptions. God makes David as strong as Superman, speedy as the Flash, a climber like Spider-Man, and a deadly with a bow like the Green Arrow. That's four superheroes wrapped up into one. No surprise, then, that in the next few verses, David describes his victory over his enemies. And it's because of God's empowerment. So, is there a match of a superhero theme? Yes, there is. But what about the other themes? Crying out to God, God rescuing David from his enemies, God as David's support, and finally, God bringing David to a spacious space? Let's keep looking. Do you see anything about crying out to God in those verses? Look at verse 42. David is so empowered by God that now David is chasing his enemies. And we get a surprise. It's David's enemies that cry out to God. But God doesn't hear them because they are the ones that have been rebellious against God. Next, in this matching passage, does David say anything about God rescuing him? Look at verse 44. You delivered me. It's another match. Does David describe God as his support? Well, that one, if you're scanning through, at least in the NIV, you're not going to see it. Again, it's a difference between 2 Samuel 22 and Psalm 18, but it's in there. In Psalm 18, verse 35, we read, your right hand sustains me. That's support. In fact, again, it's the same Hebrew word, support, as in the upper section in verses 5 through 20. And so, Dorsey's right. It's another match. What about that idea of God bringing David to a spacious space, a place of safety? Look at verse 37. You broaden the path beneath me. In both verse 20 and verse 37, the same Hebrew word is used to describe God bringing David to spaciousness, to safety. And so again, these sections are a match. Now, I've been using superhero language, but superhero language does not do this section justice. No pun intended. God is so much more than a superhero. Superhero language actually limits God, right? David's point is that God is not limited, not in the least. When God empowers David, God is not turning David into a superhero or some kind of demigod. In this section, David is simply praising God because God gave him victory. He's giving God the credit for victory over his enemies, David is correctly saying, hey, people, if you look over the years of my life and you see all those victories and how God rescued me from death's door, how God rescued me from my enemies and how I became king, you need to know that God did this, not me. Do not praise me. Praise God. Give God the credit because he is the true victor. So we found matching points for A and A prime. We found matching points for B and B prime. What about C and C prime? Let's go back to verses 21 through 25. Here's what David writes. The Lord has dealt with me according to my righteousness. According to the cleanness of my hands, he has rewarded me. For I have kept the ways of the Lord. I am not guilty of turning from my God. All his laws are before me. I have not turned away from his decrees. I have been blameless before him and have kept myself from sin. The Lord has rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to my cleanness in his sight. Is anyone else here not thinking, wait a minute, David. 
Wait just a minute here. Not guilty, blameless, cleanness? He can't be serious, can he? He committed horrible sins. Adultery, lying, murder. Either David writes this before his sin with Bathsheba took place, or he's having a serious memory problem. Or he's de completely deluded. Before Bathsheba, that was pretty much true. After ba the sin that he committed with Bathsheba, absolutely not true. So I'm not totally sure. I think even if this was written before his sin with Bathsheba, it really sounds like he's super arrogant in this passage, if I'm honest. He's very boastful. And so there's a sense in which I just find this section a little bit difficult, and frankly, I don't know how anyone could write it, seriously. But what's the theme? Let's take it at face value. God rewarded David because of David's cleanness or righteousness. Even if we find it boastful, even if we find it arrogant, I think there's still a lesson here. We are called to pursue righteousness. We are called to follow the ways of the Lord, to obey him. Jesus would eventually say to his disciples that those who obey him are the ones who love him. In other words, we don't show our love for Jesus by saying, I love you, Lord. That's a good thing to say. We show our love for God by our choices in life. Our actions reflect what is truly in our hearts. And so given that theme, let's see if we can find matching point C. We're looking for the theme of blamelessness. Look at verses 31 and 32. Here's what David writes. As for God, his way is perfect. The Lord's word is flawless. He shields all who take refuge in him. For who is God besides the Lord? And who is the rock except our God? Anything about blamelessness in those verses? Sure is. In fact, it's the same Hebrew word that is used. Look at verse 31. As for God, his way is perfect. Perfect. Blameless. It's the same thing. But this time... David's not describing himself as blameless. He's describing the one who is truly blameless, and that's God. God is the perfect rock in whom we can find our refuge. And David knows all about finding refuge. When he was a fugitive from Saul, he was running. He was hiding. He stayed in caves. He called them, the caves, his stronghold. And now he says it's actually God who's the perfect stronghold. So we have another match. And that brings us to the unmatched center. After all this praise and thanksgiving, all that remains is verses 26 through 30. And here's what David says. To the faithful, you show yourself faithful. To the blameless, you show yourself blameless. To the pure, you show yourself pure. But to the devious, you show, you show yourself shrewd. You save the humble, but your eyes are on the haughty to bring them low. You, Lord, are my lamp. The Lord turns my darkness into light. With your help, I can advance against a troop. With my God, I can scale a wall. Now, David has left us in this passage a major clue that these verses declare loud and clear that, that they are his central point. Do you see it? Something changes in these verses. If you compare these verses to the, the ones that come after, the ones that come before, there is something different. In these verses, David speaks directly to God. Look at the pronouns. You, your, yourself. In the sections that surround it, we don't see that personal direct contact. Now, he, he will mention you and your in some of the other sections of the psalm, but here he is speaking directly to God. But I think even more important than his direct communication with God is what he says. This is his central point for the whole song. And what is the central point? God exalts the humble and brings low the proud. Everything comes down to that. 
It is the idea of the great reversal in God's kingdom. Those who are low, God brings high. Those who are high, God brings low. Very similar to what Jesus would often talk about. The first shall be last and the last first. Over the years, I've come to believe that humility is perhaps the most important trait of disciples of Jesus. It's having a healthy self-awareness that knows that we must place our faith in him. That we must continue to abide in him and depend on him. The greatest sin just might be the sin of self-sufficiency. God saves the humble, David tells us. But he brings the haughty down low. Clearly then, the position that we want to be in is the position that God will save. That's the humble position. But what so often happens is that that goes against our human nature. To be humble means we have to depend on others. To be humble means we have to admit we don't have it all figured out. To be humble means we might have to ask for help, to ask for prayer, to ask for God to intervene. Humility goes against our culture. Humility goes against what we so often see from our leaders. Humility is when we have people holding us accountable, perhaps how we spend our money, how we use our time, how we treat others. Humility is something that we can actually work on and grow. In one of the classes that I teach, I ask the students to write a paper about the humility of God. I ask them to scan through the Old Testament and see if God actually practices what he preaches. God calls us to be humble. Is he? He doesn't have to be. And yet one of the things we find is just to look at the tabernacle. God said, I just want a two-car garage tent. That's it. When many of the other religions around the world in that day had gorgeous, gigantic temples, God says, I'd rather be among my people in a tent. Shows his humility. So what about us? What can it look like for us to grow humility, to work on humility, and to become humble so that God will lift us up? It starts with placing our faith in Jesus, and it just continues as we depend on him and abide in him, as Jesus himself taught in John 15, that apart from me, you can do nothing, but remain in me, and you will bear much fruit. And so I encourage you, as you are going around your Thanksgiving tables and you are sharing all of those ways that you are thankful, Work on examining your hearts and what it means to be humble. Look at the example of Jesus, who even though he was God, was willing to take on our human flesh and give himself up for us. We're about to start Advent next Sunday, in fact. And it is the time of year when we reflect on the fact that Jesus came and took on that flesh and became a humble human so that he might begin the process of salvation. What an incredible example of humility. But then fast forward in your mind when Jesus takes the beating and is nailed to the cross, giving his life, what incredible humility for the God of the universe. What can it look like for us to follow in his steps and be humble? You may have heard me share this story before, but I'll close with this. When I did my missionary internship in Guyana, South America, I spent time with a group of evangelical Bible churches, and the leader of the church one time told me about his number two. He said, here's why I chose him to be my number two. Not because of how much Bible he knew. Not because of how many churches he had started. But because that number two man was willing to serve 
in the nursery and clean up baby's vomit. He was willing to humble himself to serve. Just as Jesus says, the greatest among you are your servants. 